Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Lecture 32 will uh, begin with a detailed discussion on aliasing error and uh, trying to explain this uh, aliasing error. We will uh, explain it in a diagrammatic fashion and uh, show how different uh, components are spuriously uh, wrapped around and put inside and this alias transfer would lead to a uh, major source of error which will show through an example. And, uh, what we also note uh, very curiously enough that uh, this aliasing problem becomes more and more severe for higher accuracy methods which do not attenuate the high wave numbers. In contrast to low accuracy methods uh, which uh, so called naturally removes this high wave numbers, but then it is at the cost of the accuracy of the solution. So, it is necessary for one uh, to basically uh, uh, work out uh, a strategy where we will adopt higher accuracy method at the same time remove the sources of aliasing. So, this is what we talk about aliasing, uh, how does it affect the error spectrum and resolution and then we have made a case for uh, necessity for adopting upwind compact schemes. This upwind compact schemes are uh, have uh, uh, that uh, role of uh, removing aliasing and that is what uh, we will be talking about um, and having defined aliasing for linear and nonlinear terms, we will uh, introduce higher order upwinding to remove aliasing and then we will show that uh, the Zong's uh, compact scheme which is again a higher order upwind scheme, it is a fifth order upwind scheme but unfortunately, because of boundary closure problem once again it turns out to be an unstable method. This uh, points out the inadequacy of various uh, implicit uh, boundary closure methods that we have been talking about so far and we make a very strong case for adopting uh, explicit boundary closure and thereby using those to optimize and this is uh, the actual uh, methodology that we have adopted so far and we will highlight that. Uh, talking about that, um, uh, we also come next to discussing how do we approximate second derivatives and uh, we uh, uh, look at it as a um, competition between let us say direct Hermite interpolation uh, method of uh, directly evaluating the second derivative or evaluating the derivative uh, in sequence by using first derivative algorithms. We particularly highlight uh, what is required in many simulations that not only we express the energy content of the system correctly, we must also describe how this dissipation is. While energy may be packed in the lower wave number, we know that dissipation keeps increasing with wave number. So, there is a case for uniform uh, resolution of uh, spectrum uh, to balance in a equilibrium flow between the energy and dissipation, this is a major issue and this is a major source of error uh, which uh, initially people did not uh, suspect uh, to be of importance. Uh, reason was that people are using some kind of uh, low order method and as we will see that this kind of error becomes important uh, for large wave numbers and you have seen in this low order method. Uh, in evaluating derivatives, we have seen what happens is that high wave numbers are filtered hmm, because of the nature of discretization that we have seen. What I mean by filtered is the following that suppose I am trying to evaluate a derivative and that let us say we are not effectiveness parameter 
that what we see that uh, for the smaller wave number they remain faithful, it is only towards the larger wave number they come down. So, this is what we uh, say that this is the amount of attenuation or filtering that that particular wave number suffers. Right? If I have a, a rather a low order method, then I will see much more uh, severe attenuation or filtering. Right? So, what happens is um, this aliasing error happens whenever you are trying to compute a product of two uh, uh, unknown functions. Now, <coughs> this uh, uh, product uh, operation has been somewhat misunderstood by many and uh, in many uh, sources and books you would find they talk about aliasing as a problem to occur due to non-linearity. However, as we saw in the last class that if we are trying to solve a linear equation as simple as 1D wave equation and if we do not solve it in the physical plane, instead we go to a transform plane where the transformation matrix equation is given like this then this equation transforms to the following. So, you can see that uh, we have uh, even on a for a linear equation, we have to evaluate a product right, del u a del xi as well as del x del xi they are uh, both uh, functions of xi. So, this is uh, we are seeing here on this side. So, now <coughs> try to understand what causes aliasing. Uh, so, we uh, represent this uh, unknowns on the right hand side f of x g of x in terms of its uh, Fourier Laplace uh, transform. <coughs> so, let us say f is uh, defined in k plane and g is defined in k prime plane. Hmm. So, what we could do is uh, we could draw a portrait here. On this side let me plot k, on this side let me plot k prime <coughs> and you know the range of it is going to be minus k m to plus k m. So, if I am using the same grid, uh, so the range is fixed by the Nyquist criteria. So, that will be k m should be equal to pi by h. So, we can do that and needless to say that the product also would be also re, uh, represented in the same range because we are using the same grid. So, it is very unlikely that you could uh, evaluate p at any other resolution than what uh, you are doing with the primitives f and g. <coughs> now, uh, if I look at it then, then in this plane I should be actually focusing upon a box. So, this is your plus k m and this is your minus k m and this is also your plus k m and similarly this will be your minus k m. Okay. So, we are uh, in evaluating the product, we are essentially working in this box that is clearly understood. So, what happens is that I will write from here that p of k bar uh, e to the power i k bar x d k bar should be equal to double integral f of k g of k prime and look at the phase part now it is going to be i k plus a prime x d k d k prime. So, this integral 
is evaluated in this box, right? Because k is varying from minus k m to plus k m, k prime is varying from minus k m to plus k m. However, you also notice that individually each of these are varying from minus k m to plus k m. So, it would appear as if this phase can vary from minus 2 k m to plus 2 k m. At the same time, on the left hand side, we are saying that that is not possible, because using the same grid, I cannot evaluate the phase with a higher precision than what the grid allows. Right? So, something has to give in when k plus k prime increases above k m or decreases below minus k m. So, what are those lines where k plus k prime is equal to k m would be a line like this. right? And similarly, k plus k prime equal to minus k m would be a line like this. And what about this area? This area would correspond to this area would correspond to k plus k prime greater than k. Right? All of you see that? Comfortable with the observation? So, same way this part also represents an apparent phase which goes beyond the allowable limit. So, this is the region where this phase indicates you would be there. However, this tells you that is not allowed. So, what happens to this two path? This two path in a computation cannot remain there. They have to remain within the region. They actually fold back. How they fold back? That is what we explained in the last class also. Suppose, I plot here k bar here and let us say any function that I am plotting say p of k bar here and this is going from minus k m to plus k m. Now, the right hand side tells you that this actually can go all the way up to minus 2 k m and on this side it can go to plus 2 k. So, that is what we are seeing that is that. So, if this line represents k plus k prime equal to k m, I can draw a similar line parallel to this and that will go like this. And what is this line? This line is Right. So, in evaluating the right hand side, what I notice that my phase can also go in this region, but out of this whole region, this part is not there. Right? This does not exist. So, here p of k prime is 0 and here f of k is 0. So, this part, this triangle and this triangle is not coming into play. What is coming into play is what I have shown you here by the shaded region. right? That is indeed always happening. Now, uh, where would those contribution go? That is the question that we are debating now. So, this region, the shaded region is here plus k m to plus 2 k m. right? Now, Suppose, I have a point here. If I call this a point A, where would it go? I have made an observation a couple of lectures ago that even though when we are working in a finite domain, in a finite k space, in the back of our mind we are talking about a periodic extension in both directions. right? 
So, what happens is whatever I am doing from minus k m to plus k m, that event is replicated on either side. So, here if I go up to this 3 k m, the status in this is same as the status in this. That means what? A point A here would be somewhere here, so that this distance equal to that distance. All of you follow it clearly? What is the uh, aliasing role here? So, I have some phase which uh, puts my point beyond the range that has to be folded back within the acceptable range. So, this A will be mapped to A prime. The same way, suppose I had a point here, where will it go? This is towards the end of the, the left event. So, I have a similar thing from minus 3 k m to plus 3 k m and the point B is to the right of that range. So, that point should be within this range almost to the close to the right of this. So, if that is B, it should be mapped here to B prime. So, this is what will happen b will be mapped to b, a will go to a prime. So, what is happening is you are seeing that all these points in the admissible range are also getting spurious erroneous contribution coming from outside and they are mapping inside. So, this is what is the uh, dictionary meaning of aliasing that this b prime or a prime this should not be there but they are spuriously taking the role of those points. That is what is called aliasing, right? So, <clears throat> you know the source, because we have this region that is getting mapped inside, this region is getting mapped inside and we are getting the problem. Now, what happens is, uh, in uh, many computations, as you can see uh, that this kind of a phenomena uh, of bringing events from outside to inside would be more prevalent near the end of the ranges. How? Well, actually um, I can actually give you a, a simple example which is uh, there. Uh, you can take a look at the book. Uh, let us do the following. Let us do a little bit of uh, small accounting. Let us say um, f, I will talk about that this uh, the k varies, say discrete values, talk about Fourier series now. Say it varies between plus and minus 5 and g similarly also let us say varies between plus minus then what happens is, you can see uh, what I have here is a kind of a, a table, I will uh, just uh, tell you what will happen. If I uh, look at what k plus k prime can uh, take values and on this uh, next column, I would uh, find out how many times those kind of events occur. So, this is something like number of occurrence of such an event. And those values which are wrongly there, we need to find out where they are going to. Okay? And let me um, just uh, simply give you this idea. So, what happens is, say both k and k prime goes from minus 5 to plus 5. So, the least value it can take would be minus 10 when both are minus 5 that can happen. How many such occurrence is possible? Only once. Huh? k is equal to minus 5 and okay, but this is not admissible. 
because we are saying that working on the same grade k plus k prime has to be kept within plus minus 5 uh, uh, that modulus. What about 9? It could be 2, right? k is 5 minus 5 and k prime is minus 4 or either way. So, this will be 2. So, you can say that this will be 5, 4 and minus 4, sorry, minus 5. So, this. What about this? Then we can have 8, then we can have 7, then we can have 6. 5 is admissible. So, these are the places where things would go aliasing, right? Uh, what about 3, right? Minus 5, minus 3, minus 4, minus 4, minus 3, minus 5. So, 3 possibilities, right? So, you can uh, work it out. Okay, and this will be 4 and this will be 5. Now, yes. Well, I am saying it is like less a Fourier series. You know, go away from Fourier transform. Let us say it is a periodic function. So, I have uh, 5 harmonics for k and 5 harmonics for k prime. So, they will be all integers, right? So, it is just for sake of simplicity. Otherwise, it is going to be dense. So, what we are doing here in between, you will have to think of it. But these are discrete occurrences, even in that uh, framework. Now, now you got to tell me which is going where? Minus 10 would go where? 0, right? Good. All of you see that? Why it go to 0? Because this minus 10 is, is right in the middle of the left hand extension. That would go from minus 15 to minus 5. And minus 10 is middle of that range. And that is in the middle of also minus 5 to plus 5, right? Anybody has any problem, please stop me. So, this actually goes to 0. Where does this go? Hmm? 1, right? So, you can see that this will go to and this, something like this. Okay. So, uh, what you are noticing that aliasing can occur to every part of the wave number range, but where it is more predominant. See, these are happening many more times. While this is happening only once, this is happening five times. So, that is why based on this observation, people have made a kind of a uh, rule of thumb that aliasing problem is more severe at higher wave number. Is not that so? Because this is a higher wave number, is not it? If I am looking at minus 5 to plus 5, so 4 is of course higher than compared to 0 and 1. So, what happens is aliasing is a problem that you actually face mostly at high wave numbers. Okay. They are there in the low wave numbers too, but not so significantly uh, more than this. Then what happens is, why did not people earlier notice in computations? That was what we are discussing. But how is it the people only who were doing spectral calculation, they were bothered for decades that oh, aliasing is a problem in spectral calculations, we have to take care. But, for the other pe people who are using finite difference, finite volume and other discrete methods, they say oh, aliasing is something we do not need to worry about. It does not happen we never see. Why it does not happen? It is because of this nature. You see, if I take a low order method, then those high wave numbers where aliasing is predominant, there those quantities are anyway getting attenuated due to filtering. So, it was a kind of a benefit of ignorance. People did not know, but they were uh, being implicitly taken care of by the poor property of the numerical method. Now, suppose you start coming up with better method like what we are now discussing 
compact field. So, you, we do not have this, we would probably have something like this. Now, what happens is you can see even this higher wave numbers, they are very much present in your computations and you start seeing those effects of energy. So, what happens is as we matured, we became better in our ability, we started seeing aliasing which we thought were not there in the first place. So, that is what uh, we made this observation in the last class that aliasing is a serious source of error accumulation at high wave number and frequency. Now, you understand why I said that. A linearly unstable algorithm will deteriorate further in the presence of. So, what happens that these things energy or the uh, events seem to unnaturally pile up at the higher wave numbers. So, if I uh, am looking at let us say some physical events and I am plotting let us say the energy of the system right and I am trying to compute those, then what happens is in most of the cases as you know physical systems are band limited. It, it it comes down like this. You know, there are all kinds of subtleties, different systems shows different variation, but eventually they are kind of band limited. They come and stop somewhere. If you are trying to compute some such system and if aliasing is present, what would you uh, hope to expect? You would hope to expect that as you are computing, because of this, it is not a good thing to happen, but if aliasing is present, those aliased component will start piling up in the higher wave number range. And as you are computing, let us say time dependent problem, you will see that with time, spuriously energy will pile up at high wave number. And of course, you realize by now that most of the problems are related to high wave number, high frequency phenomena. That is what uh, we are saying also here that suppose I already have a linearly unstable algorithm, then in addition if I have aliasing that will be accentuated, hmm, that will happen more readily. So, this is something that you do and as I also told you that aliasing is a typical problem of whenever you get a product come. Uh, most of the uh, sort of uh, diagnosis of aliasing came from fluid mechanics and there actually we have problems of this kind, uh, say terms of this kind say convective acceleration terms. etcetera, etcetera. So, you can see these are the natural product terms occurring in the governing equation and they are essentially kind of nonlinear. Hmm? So, there has been a sort of a uh, sort of a mistaken belief that aliasing error is a nonlinear instability problem. That, that is the misperception in most of the uh, literature and uh, books you would find. However, from the simple example we showed that even for a linear system, you can have a product term and such product term can give rise to. We have also seen the another example which we had uh, done before. So, that was that uh, Laplacian in the transform plane. If you recall that we wrote uh, terms of this kind while talking about ADE or some sorry ADI method, we had this kind of a term. So, this uh, A would be a kind of a known function of X, it is not an unknown, but still you can see there is a double uh, product here. So, this can also give rise to aliasing. In fact, if you look at uh, fluid dynamical equations, you always uh, have to do this. this. Suppose I have to uh, get this as the dissipation term 
And now, if I am uh, looking at uh, in the transform plane, uh, it would be something like this. Unfortunately, we will not be able to do it, but it would look like this. So, that is how it would look like. And you can see, even though this is a linear operator, it involves the triple product here, H 2 is a function of xi and eta H 1. These are all grid uh, transformation quantities, but they are not constants. They themselves are functions of xi and eta. So, here you can see it is a triple product, here is a triple product. And when you try to differentiate them, those triple product, actually the problem becomes even more acute. You all would agree with me that in numerical operation, if you do some kind of a integration, you actually smooth out. Whereas, when you differentiate, you accentuate. So, if I have some error quantity and I am differentiating, that gets magnified. If I am integrating, it kind of has a effect of smoothing out. Okay. So, uh, we have a term, I am furthermore differentiating and it can be a serious source of aliasing. So, please uh, do not be swayed by any of such statement where people say aliasing is a nonlinear instability problem. Aliasing is equally bad for linear problems, right. So, uh, let us uh, keep that in mind. <coughs> now, we have uh, uh, noted that uh, when it comes to explicit methods, we can use this higher order upwinding schemes, like we have talked about third order upwind schemes, right. We did uh, work out those tensils when we are talking about discretization quite some time ago before your first midterm. And uh, there we found that uh, if we take uh, higher order upwind schemes, explicit schemes, they are quite robust and they have this tendency to suppress numerical instabilities, because upwinding involves an implicit dissipation term, right. Suppose, I do first order upwinding, what is the equivalent dissipation term we have as a second derivative term. If I am taking a third order upwind scheme, then what will happen? I am equivalently adding a fourth derivative term. So, all those uh, even derivative terms actually uh, adds explicitly or implicitly those dissipations. Term. And if you have those dissipation terms, what it does? Of course, it attenuates. And what happens? We have uh, done this exercise. If you uh, just uh, recall that if we uh, discretize, let us say, the second derivative term uh, versus k h, well, uh, l let me just simply uh, uh, just uh, show the dissipation term itself versus k h, you will notice that uh, this goes like this. So, as k increases, your added dissipation actually increases, right. And uh, this is let us say for second dissipation, right. And if I add a fourth derivative term, it would uh, behave like this. So, this is your fourth dissipation term. So, uh, what is the essential difference between second and fourth dissipation term? In the second dissipation term, you see even low k's are getting affected by dissipation. Whereas, if you take a higher order dissipation, 
they remain uh, much more uh, smaller at high k, but at larger k h, they actually overshoot the second h. So, if I have to add a dissipation, which one would I prefer? I would prefer a fourth dissipation now. Why? For two reasons, because we said that this dissipation is added to control numerical instabilities and numerical instabilities always occur at high wave number. That is what we discussed when we were talking about multigrid method also. You see that was one of your question that why in restriction you smooth and in prolongation you do not. That was essentially the same idea that we are talking about that at low wave numbers they are not such a source of problem, but at high wave numbers they are. And there is a second reason, you see most of the physical processes have physical dissipation. What is the nature of physical dissipation term? They are always the second derivative term, right. So, if I add second derivative term for numerical stabilization, there is a very good chance that I am going to tamper with the physical dissipation also. So, that is why low order dissipation are not a very good idea. If you have to do, you will always would account for higher order dissipation, because they will not tamper with the physical dissipation. At the same time, they will be able to control numerical instabilities, which are more severe at high wave numbers. And I, you can see at high k h, this uh, amount of dissipation added by higher uh, order uh, upwinding is much more. And that gives you additional control. So, this is what uh, we are saying here that if we have a upwind biased higher order schemes, they are robust, uh, they prevent instabilities and the added uh, dissipation would also help controlling aliasing, is not it. See aliasing as we said that it is a more of a high wave number phenomena. So, if I dissipate the solution at high wave number, the tendency for aliasing also comes down. Okay? There are other ways of controlling aliasing. So, I am not going to go into that, but it is just that we are talking about uh, here about upwind schemes. So, I am just telling what are the plus points of upwind schemes. So, we learned what is aliasing. We are now making an observation that uh, higher order upwinding actually uh, helps controlling aliasing error. Okay. <clears throat> so, if, if they are so for explicit scheme, they ought to be so for compact schemes, which are implicit schemes. That is what we note down there. Now, uh, very, very many people have uh, done this work. Uh, Talsvik uh, in Russia has uh, used some fifth order compact schemes for atmospheric science. Then, uh, all this uh, other people have uh, done, starting from a uh, simple linear wave equation to all the way to Zong at the UCLA claim to do direct numerical simulation of uh, uh, re-entry vehicle uh, flow transition. <coughs> okay. Now, uh, they are there. Uh, Let us uh, look at one such scheme. Uh, this was what uh, Zong proposed in 98. Uh, it is a basically a fifth order upwind scheme. What, what is uh, it that we mean by fifth order? Well, that is all embedded in equation 50. And what you would notice that uh, if it was a central scheme, then b j minus 1 should be equal to b j plus 1. That is one of the key idea of central scheme, that they have to be perfectly symmetric. However, by design, you can see b j plus 1 and j minus 1 are tweaked. They are not same, 20 they are made, one is uh, added with alpha, another is subtracted by alpha, right. So, that is how we are actually introducing upwinding there. The same thing happens <coughs> on the right hand side also with the function value coefficient a j plus k. They are given in terms of this. You notice that uh, alpha seems to be a kind of a parameter by the choice of alpha. You can control whatever the upwinding you want to. For example, of course, you put alpha equal to 0, you get the central scheme. Right? So, alpha is a parameter by which you are actually switching in the 
uh, switching in the uh, instability, I mean the upwinding. Now, as you can see, if I put alpha equal to 0, then b j is 60 and b j plus minus 1 is 20. So, what is that scheme? That is exactly the simple scheme that was used in by Adams, right. Adams had a 6 order scheme that was exactly like this, they had 1, 3, 1 here, uh, here it was 1, here it was 3 and here it is 1. It is the same thing, if you divide by 20, you will get the same uh, value. Okay. <coughs> so, uh, of course, uh, the stencil is written like this, it is uh, pentadiagonal on the right hand side and tridiagonal on the left hand side. So, you would require two more uh, uh, auxiliary relation uh, boundary closures at j equal to 1 and j equal to 2, they seem to be what uh, others have done before and uh, it was proposed and Zong continued working on it for quite some time. So, of course, we now know what we could do. Now, the choice of alpha is uh, given by the second bullet, you can see that is given uh, by adding a term which is alpha by 6 factorial h to the power 5, the 6 derivative. So, this is really higher order upwinding, right, 6 order term has been added. Okay. Now, uh, Zong actually investigated various possible cases, taking values of alpha as minus 2, minus 1 and 0, 0 takes you back to Adam scheme. Now, what we could do is, we have learned how to do a global analysis. So, we could uh, subject uh, this scheme that we have 48 to 50 and calculate k equivalent by k and find out what is being done in this case. And this is what you find. The top figure tells you about the real path uh, of k equivalent by k and the bottom one tells you the imaginary path. And uh, you could see that uh, even the real path uh, shows a kind of a real variable mixed uh, uh, values of k equivalent by k for different k h. <coughs> Although, of course, you can see it uh, takes you pretty much a high value of almost uh, above uh, pi by 2. However, that is not the thing that one should be really uh, worried about, it is the imaginary part that should tell you what is happening here. What is happening here is uh, j equal to 1 is truly unstable point that you can see. Uh, look at j equal to 2, in the intermediate range it is unstable, then of course, it becomes stable at the later stage. Then you can see this other point all these points which shows your value to be positive, they are all unstable points. So, I think uh, our analysis became very unpopular with Zong, because he did not know when he saw this, he was uh, quite upset that uh, the method is uh, full of holes. Uh, anyway, uh, we are noticing that um, even attempt in uh, introducing upwind scheme and trying to get a uh, stable method are not always very successful and uh, they are unsuccessful for the reason that uh, you are trying to have this boundary stencils one sided, right. Boundary stencils and the near boundary stencils as you can see here uh, in j equal to 1 and j equal to 2 j equal to 2 is still ok, it is central scheme, right. j equal to 2 is a central scheme as you can see, hmm? there is no problem, but j equal to 1 is seems to be the culprit and it is so bad that uh, the effect is not confined to j equal to 1, but it is confined to many, many points inside and that is happening because of the implicit nature of the scheme. So, that is where we stepped in and we said look, this probably can be uh, uh, prevented, if uh, for the boundary closure, we uh, revert back to explicit schemes. We do not have implicit schemes, because explicit schemes are truly local in nature. If I add something on the j equal to 1 node, it will only affect that j equal to 1 and not the neighbor significantly. And that is what is done here. Equation 51 is basically a representation of a first derivative. Again, it is an upwinded form, but whatever effect that will be there, it will be localized, it will not 
percolate in the interior of the domain. The same way we have uh, done something, the second point we have uh, uh, used the explicit scheme and to that we have tried to add a kind of a stabilized fourth derivative term, so that uh, we can uh, introduce some kind of a uh, explicit upwinding even for the point 2. Okay? And this is uh, what happens, uh, it may look uh, unusual, but uh, this is explained here that uh, we add a dispersion term and then uh, it also has dissipation. So, what we do is uh, we blend two of those terms to get this uh, explicit scheme with uh, beta as a control parameter, we choose beta in such a way that the overall scheme is, comes out to be good. Now, this uh, actually is uh, something we uh, do not uh, uh, make a uh, uh, lot of claim, but the point is we diagnose the problem, what is the problem with the existing scheme and we propose the solution and this is what uh, we call as some kind of a optimal upwind compact scheme, optimal in the sense that we try to figure out those uh, constants that would appear in the scheme like alpha and beta that we have manually optimized and we figured it out and then we have the global analysis tool and we can check what we are getting. So, there have a series of methods uh, proposed by us and they are essentially uh, uh, dependent upon what others have already done. For example, this scheme that we are writing here as OECS 1 scheme which is nothing but uh, removing all the problems of Zong scheme, right. So, we took the Zong scheme and we did not take such large values of alpha, we figured out in the optimization process that if we take alpha equal to minus 0.24 and that beta, beta is that uh, formula that we have used in this uh, second uh, uh, node uh, parameter for explicit uh, closure and uh, then uh, with that we found a pretty good uh, method. Okay? Now, uh, in Zong scheme we had seen uh, numerical instability at multiple points, but uh, when we plotted uh, our results this is how it looked. Okay? Please note uh, that we have uh, uh, done one thing, what we have done is the point 2, we have done something like a CD2 kind of a pencil. Right? And that is what you are seeing that uh, j equal to 2, we have a degraded uh, property here. Whereas, uh, any point inside they, they, they get better and better. What is important for us though to remember that uh, the imaginary part that was the source of all kinds of problems before. And what we found in our method that apart from j equal to 1, all the other points are stable are neutrally stable. There is no hint of numerical instability anywhere except j equal to 1. And j equal to 1 is of course, not a problem at all. Now, I told you time and again, because this is what we uh, do to calculate all the derivatives, but j equal to 1 is a boundary point. That is why you do not discretize the equation. right? So, you do not need that value. This uh, value does not go into the calculation, which is seen there as a bad point. So, this was the first scheme, which is a variation of Zong scheme. Then we went and tried to fix that Haras and Tassan scheme, because we were quite uh, uh, happy to see that Haras and Tassan scheme probably gave a very, very good, uh, uh, very, very good uh, uh, spectral resolution. So, we said, okay, we will build a scheme but we will add little bit of upwinding to the scheme. That is what we did. If you look at this uh, left hand side p j minus 1 and p j plus 1, uh, we have added an upwinding term which is given by eta by 16. Okay? So, this uh, d e and f, these are the values that is uh, essentially uh, given by uh, Haras and Tassan. So, we did not uh, change those, but we added a little bit of uh, dissipation. Uh, so that we can get some bit of upwinding, both on the left hand side and right hand side. And not only that, a Harasan Tassan scheme was a kind of 
uh, for a periodic problem. So, for non periodic problem we try to use our own closure that we have shown for j equal to 1 and j equal to 2. We blended all that together and we figured out that for this scheme we need to take beta equal to minus 0 0.025 and for j equal to n uh, minus 1 we uh, take uh, beta plus 0 0.09 and this is what you get. Once again you have a perfectly stable method, absolutely no problem here in the imaginary path. On the real path we retain uh, the good property of the basic uh, Harasthasan scheme. We may have uh, overshoot at j equal to 1, but that is of no concern. j equal to 2 is the only one which has a lower accuracy, but otherwise this method seems to uh, uh, perform very well. Uh, let me tell you for the last uh, 7, 8 years, this has been the workhorse in all the things that we keep doing here. So, basically now we have a uh, pretty good uh, well settled uh, approach to using high accuracy method by compact scheme uh, as we have shown here. I have just shown you only two schemes, if you are interested we have developed few more. That is uh, something which one can do as and when it is necessary. <coughs> now, let us now uh, talk about uh, calculating the second derivative, because those are also equally important in calculations. And uh, we have already seen that we can use the first derivative method twice to calculate the second derivative as given in that equation 56. Uh, however, you notice that uh, if you are uh, doing a calculation, then you would have to store the first derivative and from that stored value you will calculate the second derivative. And what happens is also uh, that if we use general principle of uh, compact differencing, general principle of compact differencing, what do we mean? See, uh, the compact differencing scheme is uh, generally if you are calculating the nth derivative, you can always write this. I, I, I do not have time to discuss, but those of you who have uh, uh, done any course on interpolation, you would note that uh, there are two general classes of interpolation. Uh, this is the Lagrange interpolation uh, versus uh, Hermite interpolation, right. In Lagrange interpolation, you interpolate the function value. Uh, in Hermite interpolation, you interpolate the derivatives also. So, what happens is uh, this compact scheme actually belongs to a Hermite interpolation scheme and uh, general uh, interpolation strategies of this kind. So, any nth derivative you can write in terms of the function value. So, you, so far what we have done, we have done it for first derivative. So, instead of uh, n equal to 1, if you put n equal to 2, you can write out a similar general scheme for uh, second derivative. That is what we are talking about that we can apply uh, general uh, principle of compact differencing. Now, there is uh, something interesting about uh, this difference between first and second derivative that is the following. Uh, now, uh, when we uh, evaluated the first derivative, we figured its uh, resolution by k equivalent by k, right. And what we found that it starts off with a value of 1 and at pi it ends becoming 0, depending on the method chosen, right. So, now what happens is, uh, if I use the first derivative evaluation method twice to calculate second derivative, what will happen? So, that will be like uh, doing it twice, right. So, what happens is basically you would see that it would degrade to something like this. And that means what? At Nyquist limit, your second derivative is totally ineffective, 0, right. Now, uh, this is something uh, related to properties of some physical systems, mostly let us say fluid dynamical systems that may involve 
uh, your chemical engineering, metallurgical engineering, everywhere you would see the same uh, thing. If I plot energy of the system, then as I told you that it could uh, be something like this, it could be a band limited quantity, right. So, you may be happy to choose a method where your Nyquist limit is on this side. So, you are saying, okay, my all energy has been resolved. Hmm? However, when you uh, look at uh, the dissipation term in your governing equation, there are dissipation terms like what we wrote there, nu times, recall I wrote this, this is a dissipation term, right. If I plot this dissipation term as a function of k, what I find that uh, dissipation terms actually happens like. So, dissipation term is a sort of a uh, complementary picture of the energy. So, at small wave number dissipations are less effective, but as wave number increases dissipation keeps increasing. So, much so that uh, at very high wave number you actually get the peak of dissipation. Now, if I use the first derivative twice, and if that Nyquist limit happens to be in the vicinity of the d max, you are doing a very poor job, right. You are, you are actually doing a very poor job, because that is why you need lots of physical. So, this d of k, this is physical dissipation, we are not talking about this. So, this is what you want to actually represent, but if you use a method of this kind, where at the Nyquist limit, the second derivative turns out to be almost 0, you are not able to do what you want to do. Your dissipation term is becoming totally ineffective. Uh, in fact, now having said and come this far, now you can go back and see in the Westside uh, talk that I gave at last summer in MIT. That is where we did talk about all these issues. What happens is, that uh, some of these methods, you know, sometimes we are so much obsessed by Nyquist criteria, we say, oh, I have resolved everything in the grid. But these are the major issues that we have to worry about one by one. We have seen the various sources of error. Now, this is what today we are talking about how to represent dissipation term effectively, and that uh, would be a pretty uh, bad thing to do. If I use a compact scheme and do it twice, then I know there is a Nyquist limit, the effectiveness of dissipation discretization is virtually 0 and we will not do it a very good way. Okay. Mm. So, this is a poor uh, method. So, what we can do instead, as I told you, we will take uh, the general principle of uh, evaluating the second derivative directly from the function itself. Okay. And this is what, uh, in fact, Lele has already done it. So, as you can see, the Lele's method uh, for j equal to 1 uses this tensil, j equal to 2 uses this tensil, and j equal to 3 uses this, and all that remains is to figure out this alpha a and b. Okay, I think um, in the next uh, meeting, we should be able to uh, wrap this thing up, we are virtually done there. It is time I suppose, I will also load this notes today, so you can take a look at it. And again, when we meet on next class, we should be able to wrap this uh, topic up.